The common thread underlying all of these problems is that same old story of various elite groups capturing the machinery of government to benefit themselves at the expense of everyone else. Is it reasonable to assume that another partisan politician, financially dependent on those elite groups and working within the same polarized party apparatus that created all these problems, can solve any of them? Our presentation, entitled Disillusioning Ourselves, formally details what the right, the left, and most typical Americans readily admit, that the government is run to benefit the very rich, the big corporations, and special interests. We maintain that the financial dependency both parties have on these major donors makes the United States essentially a one-party country that actually acts to absorb populist protest and render the interests of typical Americans ineffective. All the political theater is merely an elaborate diversion to hide the political reality that by design typical Americans are disempowered from exercising any direct influence on their government. Upon recognition of that harsh reality, one might be forgiven for becoming immediately discouraged, wondering in dismay with a shrug of shoulders, what can I do about it? And uttering in consolation that old defeatist cliche, you can't fight City Hall. A feeling of powerlessness is understandable, yet the fact remains we're not powerless at all. Self-serving political elites can only exist as long as we citizens tolerate it. For together, we have sovereign power if we will but only exercise it. The support and funding for a citizen's movement to topple elitist control of our government is already at hand. It simply needs to be released and directed on the focused goal of breaking the two-party monopoly by denying either corrupt party the presidency through the election of an independent nonpartisan citizen who, from personal experience, understands what it is like to live the life of a typical American and who, by the exemplification of character, will make the common good the sole objective of our government. Some people recoil at the thought of building a coalition of typical Americans with the open objective of breaking the two-party monopoly in America. We understand why some would be reticent to take on the challenge, but in all honesty, we have no choice. We typical Americans cannot passively wait for genuine leadership to rise from within a political party. We are going to have to come together and take charge ourselves if we are going to stop America from sliding into a third world country. If we just gripe and remain disunited, nothing will change. But the moment we unite behind a single citizen candidate of our selection, America will effectively be returned to typical Americans. Can millions of typical Americans, seemingly so very fragmented, joined together in one movement? To ask the question more pointedly, can modern progressives and MoveOn.org members unite with black ministers and community leaders in our inner cities with both uniting with traditional social conservatives and Tea Party patriots? While many concede that political anger is a unifying force temporarily, Anger is insufficient fodder with which to build a movement of real social and political change. Indeed, no one has offered the genuine leadership and comprehensive agenda all sides could conceivably embrace until now. Our presentations on various areas of national public policy constitute our effort to demonstrate genuine leadership and to lay the intellectual foundation for a grand populist agenda that reasonably blends all sides' priorities. We hope that millions of typical Americans find that our presentations meet this high standard so that we can quickly rally into one mighty coalition and truly establish liberty and justice for all 
so that no American is left behind. To accomplish that lofty objective, our presentation entitled Politics Without Partisanship argues that we are going to have to be willing to leave our ideological comfort zones. As Abraham Lincoln wrote in his annual message to Congress on December 1, 1862, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. We must recognize the great truth that every American of goodwill in our hope for coalition is seeing the ultimate answer to a social problem from the perspective of each individual's own experience, and only through cooperation with each other can these various aspects of the answer be pooled to form a better answer than would have come from any individual contributor. So, when a progressive sees an issue one way, and a conservative another, and someone from our inner city from yet another vantage point, genuine leadership must fit all three together into a policy that works reasonably well for all Americans. Policy cannot be predicated on only one view or for only one segment of the population. So we should rejoice and be exceeding glad that everyone doesn't see our current mess the same way, for only with the diversity of views can we avoid being blindsided when it becomes our responsibility to implement policy. This is diversity's great strength, so easily seen in sports. To this point, Dallas Cowboys head coach Jason Garrett has said, you want people in your organization, whatever your organization is, to bring different things to the table. We don't want everyone to be the same. We want diversity, and hopefully we can blend them all together and be the best team we can be. As in sports, so let it be in politics. In our presentation entitled Citizens on the March, we contend there can be no realistic hope of advancement for any aspect of the progressive or conservative agenda or removal of third world conditions in our inner cities until both political parties are handily defeated in a presidential election. Neither progressives, nor conservatives, nor inner city leaders are popularly appealing enough to garner the support necessary to challenge the system by themselves. And for the present, only fools fight among themselves in a burning house. Contrary to popular opinion, there is far more that modern progressives, traditional conservatives, and inner city residents have in common with each other than mutual hostility for the current political system. And in Citizens on the March, we delineate the considerable commonality. The apparent irreconcilable differences between the political left, right, and center is insignificant in relation to our overriding common objective of breaking the two-party monopoly and bringing to power genuine leadership, including with it an advance to a strong form of direct democracy with electronic national referendum. 